Hello, everyone. Welcome back. It's December 1st. Advent of Code has begun. Um, as usual, I don't do these to compete for time like some people do. I just seem to have a chill puzzle. I used to say I did it to teach myself new stuff. Uh, but as usual, for the last several years, I have not taught myself Rust, so I will not be doing Advent of Code in Rust. Uh, last year, I, I did some of it in Kotlin, and that was an okay experience, but... Um, Honestly, I just want to get back to some cozy little Haskell stuff. Uh, so I'm not really trying to teach myself anything particularly new here. Just have fun with some puzzles, and then when I get frustrated, I'll stop doing it. So that's that's the only guarantee you get, is that you'll get at least one video. Uh, after that, who knows? Um, if this is all a complete mystery to you, Advent of Code is a yearly you know, programming puzzle celebration that... Uh, Eric Wastel, I think is his name, does. Um, goes by Topaz online. Um, has done since I 2015? I mean, we can check, right? Yeah, 2015. Uh, and 2015 and 2016 are the only two years I actually did all the puzzles. Um, I came really close in 2020. I don't remember what made me stop. It was, oh, no, it was right. I missed a sing I skipped a single day. And the, the 50th puzzle is actually just, like, you get it for free if you've done the first 49. So this was, like, the jigsaw thing. And I was like, I am not going to do the rest of this shit. Uh, so that's just proof that I don't, I'm don't i not a completionist. I did as much as I had fun with. And that was 48 49ths of all the puzzles. <laughs> um, the last one I was not enjoying, so I didn't do it. Um, this year I'll do as much as I have fun with. That's That's the promise. Um, well, if you're if you're unfamiliar with Haskell, I think 2016 is the year that I introduced Haskell uh, the most. Like I talked through the basics of sort of how the programming language works without uh, you know trying to be an actual tutorial. Uh, you can find all these on my channel. You know, uh, I, th I think I have one for every year, right? Maybe not 2015. I don't think I was doing well i was doing youtube but i don't know if i was doing programming maybe it's there i don't know but tw one of these two years is the one that i've done twice actually i did it first in closure and then i went back and did it in haskell and i think it must have been 2015 yeah it must have been because that was before i switched jobs to the job i had in 2016 anyway so i'll also be sharing the code on github um should be linked in the description but you know, it's github.com slash amaloy slash aoc-2023. And you can find all the other ones. They don't all have completely... I think some of them were like Advent of Code 2021 or something. I don't know. Before I settled on the naming convention for... Anyway, it doesn't matter. So there is a new puzzle posted every day at midnight U.S. East, which for me is not midnight, but it's close. And you can solve it in whatever language you feel like. Um, or indeed, just solve it by hand if you really want to, although it's pretty hard. Uh, some people, you know, have posted creative ways they did things with spreadsheets or whatever. But the point is, all Advent Code ever wants from you is a number or a string or something. And how you com come up with that is your own business. They're not, they're not running your codes. You can do whatever you want. Uh, let's just get into reading the puzzle description, and then we'll look a little bit at my code setup, I guess. I have not read this. This is all completely new to me. <clears throat> Day one, trebuchet. Something is wrong with global snow production, and you've been selected to take a look. That's right, these are always Christmas-themed. You're trying to save Christmas somehow over the course of the 25 days leading up to Christmas. The elves have even given you a map. On it, they've used stars to mark the top 50 locations that are likely to be having problems. Okay, this is our excuse to collect stars this year. Places that are broken. But that should be making snow but aren't, I guess. You've been doing this long enough to know that to restore snow operation, you need to check all 50 stars. Check them all, huh? Okay. By December 25th. Collect stars by solving puzzles. Two puzzles will be made available on each day in the advent calendar. The second puzzle is unlocked when you complete the first. Each puzzle grants one star. Good luck. This is all... It's been like this every year. You try to ask why they can't just use a weather machine. Not powerful enough. And where they're even sending you, the sky, and why your map looks mostly blank, you sure do ask a lot of questions. And hang on, did you just say the sky? Of course, where do you think snow comes from when you realize the elves are already loading you into a trebuchet? 
Please hold still, we need to strap you in. As they're making the final adjustments, they discover that their calibration document, your puzzle input, has been amended by a very young elf who's apparently just excited to show off her art skills. Okay, a toddler has scribbled on our map in crayon. Consequently, the elves are having trouble reading the values on the document. The newly improved calibration document consists of lines of text. Each line originally contained a specific calibration value that the elves now need to recover. On each line, the calibration value can be found by combining the first digit and the last digit in that order to form a single two-digit number. For example, 1abc2 must be 1, 2, 3, 8, 1, 5... Yes, one two three eight one five seven seven one four two. Okay. Um. So some sort of simple string processing, right? Um, but as a Haskell programmer, I'm going to make it complicated. Uh, ah, interesting. I they almost got me on this last one. The first digit and the last digit are the same. Okay, well, maybe I won't make this too complicated, actually. I was thinking, I, I like playing around with the regex applicative package, which is a more combinatorial way of writing things that are regular expressions than the, the string-based embedded language that most uh, programming languages use. And I was imagining ways in which I might describe how to parse these lines. But the parsing task is so simple that... Um, I think I will just do it using ordinary string processing primitives and list operations. All right, fine. So we have to find the first and last digit of every line and then add them up. Let's look at my setup. This is the same skeleton that I've written for Advent Code every year for the past few years, at least when I've done it in Haskell. We don't need all of this nonsense for today, for every day, but. I think it's nice to have lambda case. I think it's nice to have applicative do in case I want to write do for applicative operations. Um, and I like to split things up into a part one and part two, each of which receive, this, receive the same input value, which I default to list of string, but we can change it. And then my main is just to read the file input.txt and then Anyway, then, and then prepare the input by turning it from the single raw string you get from read file into an input type. Uh, and then run part one and part two on it and print the result as a tuple. So that's the idea. Um, I also have a bunch of useless garbage in my cabal file that I would not do if I were a good project manager who cared about dependency hygiene. I just put in all the packages that I frequently use so I have them all without having to edit my cabal file. Um, or even that I don't frequently use, but that I want to play around with, <laughs> like recursion schemes. Um, okay, so that's the Cabal file. And we can see if I, you know, if I run main right now, it says, oh no, there's no input file. Yep, you got me. So I wrote a little, I mean, I say I wrote. I have a little program that downloads my input. I say, get me the input for day one, and it stores it into input.txt. And then we can say, main and it says oh the solution is unit unit great no information but you know our our little skeleton for the main thingy works uh for this this year for the first time only this is not a terribly exciting thing but um previously i have been reluctant to share the the program that downloads my input i'll share it now not because it's useful but because it's kind of like laughable um it's just, you know, I, I, I clicked on the link in Chrome and I said copy as curl. And then I pasted it into a file. <laughs> I say, please write to input.txt the result of curling, you know, the input for a particular day, which comes from the command line argument. And then I write a bunch of garbage. And also, by the way, here's my session cookie. Uh, which is read from tilde slash, you know, dot AOC cookie in my home. Um, 
the reason I think I didn't share this in previous years is that I hadn't thought of extrapolating the, or extracting this to a separate file. And so the program had my session cookie embedded in it. And if I showed it to you, you could hijack my session, which I didn't want. Uh, this year I finally was like, wait a minute, I could just put that in a different file. So there you go. That's, that's all I'm doing is I'm just like pretending to be Chrome. Um, nothing fancier than that. And I'm doing it out of band. I don't have my program doing it. They, they discourage... They say it's fine to use automated programs to download your input, but make sure you don't like wastefully do so because the servers are very busy during advent of code. Um, so I just I just do it by hand and put so I can check it in. You know, don't I don't want it to be part of the program. My God, this should be able to run while well offline, right? Anyway, so uh, I think prepare. I think input. Yeah, a list of string that makes perfect sense. That's what our input should be. We have a list of lines, and on each line, we want to look at the characters in it, so a, a list of string. Um, one thing I think I will need is import data.char of like, I don't even know what these are called. Uh, that's not how you say dot char, there we go. Uh, oh, let me also, hang on, where's my advent of code window? It's over here. Okay. So what's what are the things in data.char? Uh, looking on Google here. Show me data.char, please. Uh, documentation. Yep, yep, yep. So like, how do I how do I know if a thing is a digit? Is digit? Yep. There we go. Um. So we have is digit. How do we how do we turn a digit into its? Is it like ORD? No. That's a different thing. Single digit characters. Digit to int. Of course, I knew that. Great. So we want those functions. Uh, we'll want those from data.char for sure. Um. So what we want to do for part one, um, first of all, it, the result type should be int. I think I could plausibly write this point free, but let's, well, let's try it. Why not? It'll be fun. Um, so first thing I want to do is map. It's sum of map row. Oh, what, are the, what do they call the calibration? Okay, calibration value. Calibration value where calibration value of a row is. God, this is the like absolutely grossest thing you can write, but point, point free, man. We got to do it. Um, let's see. Let's add up the result of digit to int of first. No, wait, head is what it's called in this programming language. And no, oh, I guess I don't need eh, just in case. And digit to int last should be the name of the function, I would imagine. Uh, applied to filter is digit. Mm, composed with filter is digit. This is. I'm really killing myself here. Oh, it's it's inferred the type that uh, calibration value should have here as list of char to int. Well, that's nice. Maybe this is right after all. And if it is, then uh, 
and then I'll explain to you what it is I'm trying to do. Oh, I guess I should... Okay, it, it compiles. Good, good. My, my Haskell IDE setup gets jankier and jankier every year because I don't put any effort into maintaining it and, like, things just kind of rot a little bit. Uh, so let's just try stack run. It's a number. Okay. Eh. Why not? Let's see if it was correct. If it is, we'll be very excited, and then I'll explain these ancient scribblings, archaic scribblings, maybe. Too low. Okay, great. Oh, I forgot. Yes. We're not supposed to add together. Actually, let me just stay on this window. We're not supposed to take a one and two and add them together. We're supposed to concatenate them as a string. Uh, so 12, not 1, 2. So this is actually pretty easy to fix. Uh, so let's just take the first one and multiply it by 10. I don't really... <sighs> whatever. I don't, I don't know how to... My interactive... I have like... I'm, I'm in LSP mode. It shouldn't be that hard to get interactive Haskell running, but I'm too stupid to figure it out, so I just have a separate window where, uh, um, where I have GHCI running. That's a bigger number, and it's bigger by, like, 40,000, which is about what we would guess based on the error I made, right? It's off by, I'm sorry, about a factor of five, because instead of, like, 10, instead of, like, 10x plus y, I had x plus y. So I was off by, like, I had two elevenths of what I should have had. So this, this looks like about right. Um, let's try this again. That's the right answer. Amazing. Okay, cool. I thought it would be a little bit more work to get something as arcane and useless as this to, to work. Um, and indeed... This isn't really point three because I've named calibration value. Like the truly insane take would be to do this, right? Um, which should still do the same thing. Yeah. This is a, <laughs> okay. So why is, why is LSP mode think this is like ugly and bad? Okay, it just didn't like my cut and paste. I don't know. Um, so what what on earth is happening here? Uh, basically, what I have is I want to map. So this is why it was much clearer to write with at least this. Um, I want to map a function over the list of strings in the input. That function being compute the calibration value of the row of the line. And then I want to sum the results of all the calibration values. How do we compute the calibration value of a line? Well, we can compose several functions over it. Specifically, I guess, two. Um, first, we filter only the digits from the line. Simple. Then we run this psychotic function. Um, what does this even mean? It basically says, add together the, and, and then we're like working in the function applicative, which is bad style and nobody likes it, but I find it kind of hilarious. Um, and it's concise. Um, so we, we need to find a function from character to, actually from list of character and if we were to ask somehow, although I can't figure out how, if I were to ask LSP mode, what is the type of this? It would say, oh, this is a function from list of string to int. Um, and that's we could, we're giving it a list of the digits in the string and it's producing an int for the calibration value. So like, that's correct, that, that's what we wanted. Um, working in the function monad slash applicative we're basically leaving implicit the argument to the function and just accessing it via applicative machinery. So this says, I'm going to give you a two argument function and then two other functions. 
uh, when you use this, you know, dollar and the, the, the applicative sigils here. The first function, each of these functions, you should call on the input to the overall function we're producing. Then you should call plus on the result of those two functions. So we're basically saying add together the results of these two computations on the input list of di di uh, digits. Oh, actually, hang on. I can do this a little bit nicer, can't I? I can remove the repetition of digit to int. And now it actually looks a little bit more tolerable if I say this, right? Filter out the digits, convert them all to ints, and now I have a function from list of int to int, that function being find the last one and the first one multiplied by 10 and then add those together. And now this actually looks like kind of legible in my opinion. You know, they called me mad, mad I say. Uh, but who's laughing now? It's me. I, I don't know, I think this is kind of pretty. Um, you know, we, we could instead do something else like say, um, we, we could make the argument non-explicit and say, you know, uh, uh, what, what would, what would I call this function? I mean, I guess it would just, it would just be, I only want to replace this part. What do you call this? first and last as number of x's is 10 times head x's plus last x's, right? Like, we could write this. Um, and then this would be first and last as number, right? And this is like pretty straightforward, but it's also, I don't know, it's not as much fun. So I'm gonna write this. Um, I don't, I don't know exactly what I want out of advent, advent of code, but this is some of it. So let's go ahead and add that. Day one, part one. I don't know why it keeps taking the stack.yaml.lock. I don't even think I'm opening that file very much. Why is it? Well, I guess stack. It's not being locked by Emacs. It's being locked by stack. But why? Is it because stack GHCI is running? If I went over here. Uh oh. All of my files are modified. Did I not commit? The, I had some issues with line endings, and I had to do a global edit of all the files. I guess. Mm. Okay. You know what? Let's just get reset soft to. The last commit. Yeah. Okay. Uh. Okay. There's. Well, that file obviously should be different, right? There we go. That's the difference between the committed value. I think I didn't actually mean to reset soft. I meant to reset mixed. But either way, it looks okay. Um, so let's get rid of the soft. I just put the soft in because like, that's the, the way to make sure you're not ruining anything. And now if I look at diff dot, yeah. It's, it's all this, okay. Blah. Um. All right, let's try it like this. Git commit source day one, part one. We'll commit that, and then we'll say git commit fix new lines for whole project. And then let's get rebase dash i, so I can do this in a different order. So let's say I did this before that then. 
So I have day one part one, project skeleton. So how do I merge these two together, right? It's a little bit. If it weren't the first commit, it would be easy. But I think the first commit is kind of weird, right? Um, I don't know, whatever. I'll just leave that stupid commit in, I guess. Great, so let's finally stop all this faffing about with git and go look at part two. Your calculation isn't quite right. It looks like some of the digits are actually spelled out with letters. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine also count as valid digits. Ooh, eight, okay. Now, okay, this one, A23, what are we meant to, I, obviously the two is in here to make it like, it blends with the eight to make things more difficult. And we're supposed to treat this as eight, that's fine. But what if it were just A2? Would that be eight and two? Or would it be eight or would it be two? Do we have an example of that? Okay, 16 is not valid, huh? Ah, 1, 8. Here's the example of how to treat that. So the last line has 1, 8. Oh, but the last one says 4. So we can't quite read this as saying... Like, what if there weren't a 2, 3, 4 at the end? How am I supposed to process that? I see stuff like twin. We're supposed to treat that as 2 in section 4, right? That's fine. So, we, uh, you can't just do stuff like line or character by character now. You have to basically like, I guess the idea would be to do kind of a sliding window approach where you take yeah I guess tails is pretty good for this right you take each substring of the string trimming off one character at a time from the from the front and then you say is there a digit starting here? Um, right? And you, you map that over all the tails of the string, keeping the ones where there are, I guess. Or all, all the indices in the string, or the, the, sub, the tails of the string, as Haskell would call it. So let's let's actually look at tails as an example here. Um, no, stack that with the lock is still there, even though I left GHCI. I don't know, man. Hopefully, it's not an important file. Fuck off. <laughs> I don't know. I guess I should just add it to my git ignore, right? It's not already there. Did I already add it to my? The fact that yaml that lock is not committed. I thought I, I didn't think I had. I have dot stack work in my gitignore, but I don't have stack yaml lock. I don't think. Weird. Okay, well, whatever. Maybe it's fine. 
Uh, Tails. I was going to show you Tails. Stack GHCI. Um, if we look at the Tails of... Hello? Send data.list. Import data list Tails. Yes. So it basically gives us the result of removing one character, then the result, or zero characters, then one character, then two, then three, then four, and, and so on forever, until we're out of characters in the string. And I guess I was going to have different processing where I say, oh, if it's a digit, then like convert, you know, first check if there's a digit there, and if so, then like an actual numeral, if then then convert it to its string value, uh, numeric value, I mean. But, and, and have a separate thing that says, okay, and then check for strings, and I'll list for you, you know, all the digit, the single digits, zero through nine. But I think it would be better to make those two steps uniform, right? So what I imagine then is, I guess we'll put it in part two, or above part two, after part one, uh, a digits, digit, sure. Digits is a list of tuples of string and int, right? Um, and digits is two things. First, it's um, Oh, is there such a thing as int to digit or something like that? There is, okay, I'll want that too then. Um, pure of int to digit x and then x for x in zero to nine. So it's that Plus, we then have to add on a bunch of stuff. And I guess it's better to do it in the other order, like, but not for a really big reason. So it's this other list we're about to write, plus that the list, the list comprehension we just wrote. Um, so we can say zero, no, yeah, zero, I mean, sure, that should be allowed, right? Are there zeros in the example input? Uh, Oh, it actually says one through nine are valid digits. It does not include zero. Let me go look at my input file. There are no zeros in it. Okay, so let's just not include zero then. So we have one scores one, two, scores two, three, which scores three, four, scores four, five, scores five, six, scores six, seven, look how many letters there are in seven, scores seven, Oh, let's split it up after four, shall we? Uh, the weird Haskell style for lists is this. So that the commas align with the opening brace. Eight, eight, and nine, not nine. And then close, line up the closing brace as well. So 
So first of all, does that even compile? Did I mess anything up? That's fine. Okay. So if we now look oops, at digits, we can see there it is. There's this. There's you know. We got the the strings right. Um, both both the manually written ones, I hope, and the ones that. Uh, that we converted just from single digit numbers. Um, and I, we have like a function. I guess I want I want a few things. Let's say part two is again. I assume we're supposed to add these up. Yes, we have new calibration values. Okay. Calibration value of a string So we basically just have to replace is digit and map digit to int, right? So we could we could maybe Maybe what we could do is a calibration value is a function is ex now an external function from list of int to int. And then we can just line that up, right? Um, I think we want to map maybe here, which might have been a kind of cool thing to do Previously, I don't know. Map maybe of decode digit. Let's say where decode digit of ah, hang on, tails. Oh, this is not right. Calibration. Uh, Is this right? So map maybe we're calling tails on e on the input, which is a list of string. No, we're mapping maybe over tails. So we're calling tails on each line, which is what I want. It gives me a list of list of int. Then I call decode digit on that list. I don't think so. I want to map decode digit over each of the tails that we've gotten. Data list tails, import data, maybe, map, maybe. Um. So decode digit then is given a substring after having trimmed off some of the beginning, basically, right? So in in fact, let's suppose I asked Haskell to help me out here a little bit. Reload. What is the type total here? And also, is something else wrong? Oops, that's not how you scroll. Something else is wrong. Yeah, I guess, right, I I didn't actually, 
I didn't do this extraction right. Because calibration value... Do I just want that? No, of course not. Uh, well, maybe. Almost. Yeah, suddenly the first part compiles fine. It's only the, the new function I'm writing that's wrong. Decode digit. Oh, good point. I think, I mean, decode digit is what should be calling that maybe, right? So, map calibration value. I'm actually, they're supposed to be like this, right? Yeah, so that type checks and we need, we have a hole there that I haven't written and it says, it's of some type. You haven't told me what you expect to return, so who knows what it's supposed to be, man? It's of type P, bound by the inferred type of decode digit, which is P. Why is that? Why is that completely unbound? It's a rigid type variable. I mean, if I say it's of type list, it's type string to maybe int, that's sort of what I think it should be. Yeah, so that's right. Now, if I said it was type like string, would you be okay with that too for some reason? It seemed like you were saying it could have any dang type at all, but I, I guess I just misunderstood you. Huh. There's some type inference happening somewhere that I'm not happy with. But okay, so now like we have, all we have left to do is write this function from string to maybe int that like processes digits, right? Pretty simple. Um, we iterate over the values in digit and see whether, oh, I need to take a list is prefix of, right? I want to do like a list comprehension, obviously, over the input, but it's like, I've kind of painted myself into a weird corner by using map maybe when really what I want is a list operation, right? Like I want a function, well, anytime you start a sentence with I want a function, maybe you should look on Google, huh? Um, no, get out of here. I don't, I don't. 
I don't show you guys my browser or <laughs> anything, just in case. Um, so I wanted to search on Google for a function that takes a list of A and like returns what exactly? And returns, oh, and an A, let's say. No, I don't want a default value. I want to skip it. What what is what is bothering me here? Why am I bad at this? I want to map a function over this. And get back a list of only the successful results. That's what map maybe is for. It's just a little bit weird to leave the list monad to enter maybe for a second and then go right back to lists, but I guess that's just life. Um, I now want, like I want to produce a list of the results of this function that produces, I have a new function that produces a maybe. Ah, is it, do I want mconcat? Because I, I kind of want to produce a list of maybes and take the first one, the first just. That's what I want to look on Google for. I have a list of maybe A, and I want to produce a maybe A. Run get first. Yeah, first justs. But is there like one that doesn't suck? Because, <sighs> like, kind of what I want. What what I uh, what I really wanted like if I have a monoid A I want like a list of A and it's gonna tell me of course you should use mconcat but that's not quite what I want is it maybe it is what what do I get if I say just one if I say mconcat that as a Maybe int. Really? Oh, wait. No, why is... Uh, why do you need int to be a semi-group for this? Is maybe not... Surely maybe is a semi-group, right? Uh, I see. A is a, sorry, maybe A is a monoid, but only if A is a semi-group. Okay, and what about lists? Well, no, I don't care about that. So like probably what I'm supposed to do is look up here. There's ooh, alt. So basically, yeah, I guess this makes sense. You, you can't get a monoid out of maybe without biasing it to left or right. Um, and so you, instead of using maybe A, you use first A to say, I want something that acts like maybe, but bias is left, basically. That should be a last, yeah. But, okay, so what about, 
All right, let me go back actually to maybe. Is it already a semi group, maybe? Only if A is a semi group, so it combines the justs. Yeah, that makes sense. A very sensible instance, but not the one I wanted. Um. All right, so I mean, I guess what that means is we can, if we want, import data monoid. I assume is where that was. Uh, oh, it's in data maybe? No, I'm in the wrong place. Data monoid, yes. Data monoid of first and get first. I want to think of this as a monoidal operation and not some like bespoke thing that we're running. Actually, I don't need any of the constructors. I just need first and get first, right? Yeah. Um, so then I want to say it's mconcat of map decode digit of s. Find, I don't know, we'll, we'll write a function called find in a second. Map find s over digits, basically, and find of, oh, actually, I guess, I don't need, I can, S, S is already in scope, but I, I can just have it be a parameter here. Where find is of KV if K is prefix of S is, I assume the constructor is called first? Yeah, of course it is. First of just B. Oh, actually, I could do a little prettier than this, right? Um, otherwise is nothing, right? Does that, does that make any sense? What do you think, Haskell? You don't like it. I thought I imported first. Data monoid first. Oh, of course, you're right. I did, I said I didn't need any of the constructors, but in fact, I need the one called first. So probably don't even need get first then, right? Because surely that's, um, well, it compiles. Yeah, so give me first the type, and then also its constructor, namely first, and its accessor, namely get first. So here's, here's my idea for part two. We say, get the tails of the input. For each one, try to decode a digit. And give me a list of the results of trying each such thing. Uh, but throw away the times where you failed. Or well, try to parse each digit, throw away the ones that failed. Now I have a list of digits. I want to map that function over all the lines. Map f composed with map g should just be f compo map of f composed with g, right? Shouldn't I do this? Isn't isn't this fine? It is. Okay. So we we are mapping a function over the lines that we're given. That function is Give me the tails of that list. 
Then try to decode that into a digit, but throw away the ones that fail. Of the ones that you succeeded with, call calibration value, the function we already defined, that gives you 10 times the head plus the last. So the interesting thing, of course, here is decode digit, which is a function from string to maybe int, where I work in the first monoid, which is just a, a variation on maybe with left biasing. I'm looking, I'm mapping a function over digits, that function being try to find the named digit at the beginning of our string using find uh, and wrap the result in first. Then add together the results of doing that for each of the tails that we were given, or each of the each of the digits we looked at, each, each of the digit descriptors here. Um, and call get first on that, and you'll get a first hit, or you'll get a first nothing. And and you'll have, as a result, you'll have a maybe int. OK. And our find function is, if k is a prefix of the string, then yep, here's the value, otherwise nothing. So do we think that's going to work? It might work. It compiled. Like, how wrong could it be, right? It's a number very close to what we had before, which is very promising, in that it's in the same ballpark, which makes sense because we're only changing like one single digit number to a different single digit number. And it's different, so we didn't accidentally do the same thing. So I'm I'm optimistic. That is the right answer. Okay. So there's my there's our advent calendar. Amazing. So what, what have I done differently here? I mean, I've rewritten like everything, which is a little sad, but um, you can kind of see, well, I guess we could do this a little bit. Okay, let's, let's commit what we have so far. Git commit dash m commit dot of a1 part 2. And now let's get back to this and try to find some more commonality between part 1 and part 2, right? They're both this sum and map whatever calibration value dot something. But like in this one up here, I'm using the prebuilt functions digit int and filter is and is digit and I'm combining them with like map and filter. Whereas here I have a single map maybe doing both jobs. We could have written the above one with filter and map, or written this one with filter and map as above, but we'd have a partial function, right, where we filter out is digit, and then we call like, oh, this thing's definitely a digit, look it up in the list and don't worry about it, right? Um, and... In some sense, like, we already had that problem. Digit to int is a partial function, right? It it assumes the input is an int, or a digit, you know, representing an integer, and then gives it to you. Well, like, what if it isn't? You, you probably get an error, right? Digit to int of q. And it's like, what? That's illegal. You can't do that. Um, so that's fair. This... This is in some sense less clean. Well, I don't know. Obviously, it looks a lot nicer. Um, but wouldn't it be kind of nice if we had um, taken this map and filter thing and turned it into something that was more provably correct? Um, one approach would be to re-implement, like, Digit to int maybe. Oh, that feels pretty bad. Does that exist? Just out of curiosity. Data.char. I assume not. I don't know why I assume that, though. Um, int digit. Yeah, so we, these functions just give us. Oh. Oh, digit int. Okay, right. Wait, yeah, but if I look at is digit, 
That doesn't allow hex things, right? We, we would have had some problems if I had done that. Is digit. Yes, zero to nine. Okay. So, but the thing, the, the sort of sad thing is this, we don't have a function like this that that has a signature like our map maybe of decode digit. If we had like a character to maybe int, that would kind of be a pure way to say a non-partial you know, way. It's fine for your primitive functions to be partial sometimes, but it's nice to get away from that world as quickly as possible. And if we combine these into a single function, then we could use the same map maybe approach that we have here. Um, and then we could factor out some commonality between part one and part two so that they really represent part one and part two only need to be the difference. They only need to specify the things that are different between part one and part two of the problem, not the things that are the same. So what if you said safe, if we said digit to maybe int, um, is a char to maybe int. I'm just like getting a little bit, it's not quite, this tails thing is a little, hmm. it's gonna be a little awkward to filter out the tails. So here we have a map maybe. But here, there's not really, like, this This represents the map maybe, but the whole tails thing is not quite as easy to filter out, huh? Mm. I mean, obviously, you could make a parameter for tails. I don't know. I think this is still a nice function to write. Digit to maybe int of C where is digit C is digit just of digit digit to int of c otherwise is here's a funny idea <laughs> what if we abstracted this just a little bit more just 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 for a treat um is nothing right and this is, you can, you can imagine writing a lot of functions in this way, right? Um, so what if we defined a function that took this pattern of call test function and then if it succeeds, call another function and wrap the result in, call a partial function and wrap the result in just, otherwise fail. So what if we said guarded Guarded by is a, takes a function from A to B and a function from A to bool and returns a function from A to maybe B. Where we have, we have this, oops, guard, get, get over there. Guarded by. Uh, fp, let's say, such that p of mm, fpx, such that p of x is f of x, wrapped in just, and otherwise is nothing. And then we could just say digit to maybe is just, um, digit to int guarded by is digit, right? Like, does that all type check? Yes, we're not using the new functions yet. But this is actually kind of nice, right? You can, you can like, make explicit the fact that, like, well, I've got this partial function here and a tester saying whether it's okay to use the partial function. But I don't want to have to do those two steps myself. I'll just give those to you. And guarded by will give me back a function that I, that'll give me like a maybe. That's kind of nice, right? And then we can t take this and say map maybe of 
well, we don't even really need to give this a name, right? I just wanted to see if it would type check with that type. <laughs> Map maybe of that, right? And this still type checks, and I believe should run correctly. Yeah, it looks about like what we had before. Is it exactly what we had before? Uh, let me just open up the input here. 55712, right? Yeah, okay. So we're getting somewhere. We've made this a little bit pretty. Digit int guarded by is digit. Um... Now the problem is, of course, we don't, this, this like guarded by idea isn't really useful for part two because um, we don't just have like a function we can call and then like, oh, okay, if, if it was okay, we don't have like a guard we can easily test and then ignore its result. We have like a pattern and we want to check like, oh, okay, you know, was it here? If so, let's use the value that was attached to it. But it helped us turn these two into, you know, part one and part two now look closer together, right? Is there already a function with this type on Google somewhere? There must be, right? Nope. Interesting. Okay. Um... Oh, uh, it would be so nice to, I don't know. I mean, we can do the kind of very routine factoring out of part one and part two just to like avoid duplication, but it's not gonna be very pretty, right? Solve takes um, you know, a function from input to A, I guess. And then a f fuck. Uh, tell you what, why don't you figure out what type solve has? Um, what I want to do is say solve f and g. It's got to take two functions. Sum that map calibration value map maybe f composed with G. That's that's what I want. And then we can say solve, part one is solve of this and identity. So would you say that that compiles? You're warning me that solve doesn't have a type and then saying, here's the type it should have, but you're compiling. And if I run it, I get the same result. Okay, so we haven't, we haven't broken anything. We just didn't put a type in. And part two then is solve of decode digit and tail. Right? Yeah. So I don't think this is especially pretty, but, um, oh God, it's got the right type for solve is right here. Okay, I'm gonna cheat and use my actual mouse to copy this because I don't know how to copy stuff out of that buffer using Emacs. <laughs> Uh, oops, uh, paste, there we go. A to maybe int. B to list of A, list of B. Did I, did I get the A1s right? Yeah, okay. So 
But I think really the A's and the B's ought to be switched the way this is written, right? List of A, list of B, like, this is kind of some, you might, what do you call it when, like, degenerate, I guess? <laughs> degenerate defa refactoring, where, like, you're just removing duplication, but you have no idea what ab abstractions you're defining, and so the result is kind of a mess. Um, but it's it's kind of nice to to factor things out for the sake of it, right? And now each of our functions is sort of fairly comprehensible within itself, right? Like part two is solve the code digit on the tails of the input. That's maybe the most, what is tails doing here? But then like decode digit, yeah, this is reasonably clear. You can sort of see what's happening. Digits, very clear. Part one, yeah. Digit int guarded by his digit. That makes sense. Solve. Simple enough that, or short enough that you can kind of digest it all at once. Guarded by, I don't know. So it's kind of a little bit too much abstraction, but that's fine. Not abstraction, really. Deduplication. Abstraction is too lofty a name. And we, we discovered some some reasonable you created oh, stack.yaml.lock, how dare you? No edit please. Isn't that a thing? No Oh dash dash no edit. Okay. So I need to get that into my git ignore, which I guess we can do now, right? Echo stack yaml lock. Great, now it won't keep trying to commit that. Um, I keep that in my global git ignore rather than the private one for each project because that's you know part of my workflow, not part of the project. And no one else uses these, but that seems like the platonic ideal of how git ignore files should work to me is that you know i shouldn't have to have a git ignore file filled with all sorts of shit for every editor that anyone in the project ever uses to edit this file stuff related to your own workflow should go in your global git ignore stuff related to the project should go in the project git ignore anyway um and we can just get push this and be done for the day oh I can't because I haven't even created the GitHub project for it yet. Okay, well, we'll do that another time. Hope you guys enjoyed. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.